It's eight o'clock. This is the UK tonight. As the Prime Minister confirms, six British people have been killed and at least 10 are missing after Hamas's attack on Israel. More than a million people are trying to flee Gaza and escape this war, but the border crossing to Egypt has remained closed. Thousands of people trying to leave, humanitarian groups desperately trying to get in. Tonight, Israel's military says 199 people are being held hostage by Hamas inside Gaza. We're going to be speaking to the family of two of those hostages, a 15-year-old and an 8-year-old, kidnapped by Hamas almost 10 days ago now. Here in the UK, the House of Commons falls silent in tribute as Rishi Sunak calls for the immediate release of hostages. Also on the programme tonight, a transgender healthcare system not fit for purpose. The words of one family as an inquest into their daughter's death is a person being referred today could face a 20-year wait. We'll bring you the story of Alice Lippman as told by her dad, Peter, who faced with that weight, took her own life. How that must feel for a young person who has this, this huge journey on their shoulders mm. to be constantly, effectively told, you don't matter. And eventually, sadly, Alice believed that. The government's plan for prisons already bursting at the seams, putting minor offenders to work in the community rather than putting them in a cell. And is this where the magic started? The small Lincolnshire village with a special reason to mark the 100th anniversary of Disney. All that to come and much more on The UK Tonight. Tonight, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza appears to be worsening. More than a million people are trying to flee Gaza before the anticipated Israeli ground offensive begins. Aid agencies are warning of a desperate situation inside the region, with water and fuel supplies running low. Thousands are now waiting to the south at the border with Egypt, but a safe corridor out is closed despite diplomatic efforts to open it and let in humanitarian aid and allow foreign nationals to leave. Today, Israel said 199 hostages are inside Gaza, taken by Hamas more than a week ago. Sky's Thomas Moore reports on the events of today so far. At the border between Gaza and Egypt, people are massing in their hundreds, if not thousands, clutching whatever they could carry. Families desperate to flee the bombs and a worsening humanitarian crisis hoping the gate to safety will open sometime soon. Under a deal brokered by the United States, those with foreign passports should be allowed to cross, but Egyptian authorities are unwilling to open up without assurances from Israel that it's safe to do so. To be honest with you, today is horrible. We went to the Rafah crossing and we imagined that there is a ceasefire and it turned out to be nothing. Actually, the missiles were fired on our heads on the way there and we found hundreds of people are staying just waiting for the crossing to open. The city of Khan Yunis has seen its population double as people flee the evacuation zone in the north of Gaza. There's not enough food or water. And hospitals have been overwhelmed with casualties. The Palestinian prime minister called for the bombings to cease. We are people of, of a civilization. We are not a, he, he, animals like they are painting us, and our people will not surrender. And we are, we are appealing to the, to the Prime Minister of Israel to stop aggression. New body cam video has emerged from a Hamas militant who crossed into Israel on October the 7th. They attack a residential complex, heavily armed, moving from building to building, hunting down the people who lived there. Israel now says 199 hostages are being held in Gaza. Hadass fears her mum, children and ex-husband are among them. I could hear them. They come in the house. They broke, they smashed, they... It was a massacre, yeah? It was really, like... Holocaust. Meanwhile, the diplomacy continues. After a whirlwind tour of the Middle East, the US Secretary of State touched down in Tel Aviv for the second time in a week, 
with a clear message for its ally. You know our deep commitment to Israel's right, indeed its obligation, to defend itself and to defend its people. And in that, you have and will always have the support of the United States. Israeli forces continue to build on the border with Gaza. The defense minister says it will be a long war and the price will be high. Thomas Moore, Sky News. Uh, we just want to bring you some breaking news. Belgian media reporting that two people have been shot dead in the centre of Brussels tonight. Uh, these are the latest pictures we have here at Sky News from the scene. Uh, Europe correspondent Adam Parsons uh, is on the phone uh, with more details. Uh, Adam, this literally happening within the last 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, we were first alerted to this incident at this very early stage. What can you tell us? Yeah, so what we understand is that two people uh, have been shot dead in uh, very near the centre of Brussels in a local Boulevard Deeper, which is near the Molenby uh, district of Brussels. Uh, now, there are various reports. Uh, there are video images that seem to show a man in a, in a fluorescent top. Uh, reports that he was using a, a Kalashnikov-style rifle. Uh, we are told that the victims of the shooting are Swedish uh, nationals. Now, Belgium are playing Sweden in a football international that kicked off uh, 20 minutes ago. It's not certain whether these two people were in the city for that game or whether that is merely uh, a coincidence. At the moment, it is understood that the gunman is still free, uh, that, uh, that having chased somebody into a building, having shot them, that he has escaped... Uh, and has yet to be caught. The area, of course, as you would imagine, uh, has been cordoned off. Uh, various other suggestions. We don't know yet whether this is related at all to, 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 the, uh, to the events in the Middle East. That certainly, according to witnesses who are on the scene, are suggesting that it is, but that is absolutely not confirmed uh, yet. I, I suppose it is worth saying that uh, Brussels has got a, a relatively recent memory of Islamist uh, attacks uh, at the Brussels airport where a lot of people died. Those people who were involved in that attack have recently been sentenced. Also, some of those who carried out the Bataclan attack in Paris uh, were not just from Brussels, but were from very near uh, to the area where the shooting happened uh, tonight. So, of course, we will be watching this and bringing more details uh, as soon as they come to us. Adam, thank you. Adam Parsons uh, following events for us as they unfold in Brussels. Uh, we'll keep you updated right here on Sky News throughout the course of the evening. Now, today, the Israeli military confirmed 199 people are currently being held hostage by Hamas, with hundreds of families desperately searching for loved ones, among them Nir and Olivia, whose cousins are from Kibbutz Nahal Oz, and they were kidnapped in the attack on Israel. Well, Nir and Olivia join me now here on the UK tonight. First of all, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, your cousins who were taken in that attack by Hamas on Israel are just 15 and eight years old, two young girls. Can you tell me what you know about what happened to them on that weekend? Um, well, basically, when, we, when I talked to the mum, uh we we didn't know much uh so uh, the mum uh, her name is Mayan uh, she tried she tried phoning the ex-husband uh, she tried messaging him because there was a lot a red alert uh, of bombing in Israel uh, so um around uh, six, half past 6 in the morning she got message everything okay we are in the uh, shelter in the safe room uh, and since then, she since half past six, she tried to con them, contact them. Uh, until nine o'clock, she tried. Uh, no messages, no nothing. And around two o'clock in the afternoon, the same day, Saturday, she got message from the uh, older sister. Uh, please check your WhatsApp because uh, they've been kidnapped. The two girls been kidnapped. That's what they know until now. Uh, they dress them in different clothes. They put them on. I believe, uh, underground. Uh, and we don't know what's happened to the father yet. We know he's injured. We know the little girl, Ella, 
uh, injured because we can see the um, her arm is uh, with with bent, uh, and that's it. That's what we know for now. Oh, and the stepmom and the stepbrother we know got shot. This was ten Outside days ago. That's Dickler, by the way. Yeah, yeah. that's Dickler. Yeah, Dickler that and yeah. Tomar, okay. the seventeen-year-old boy, and Dickler, the stepmother. Okay. Um, so the stepmother and the stepbrother were taken along with the two girls, who are fifteen and eight years old, and it's been ten days now since they were taken, and in that no, they, time... No, they, 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 they... Uh, yeah. No, sorry, please continue. Yeah, no, they, 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 they've been shot outside the house. They, the little girls and the father have been taken. Uh, Dekla was confirmed killed okay. last night, and Tomer just this because morning you, was confirmed. Because you obviously need to understand the extent of recognised the bodies, the, the, the amount of bodies. So it took a week until we can confirm uh, they did. Uh, so that was just last night and this morning that they got the confirmation it's their body. Uh, but the pictures from Gaza have uh, been since last Saturday uh, for the two girls. We don't know what's happened to the father yet. OK. We know he's been shot, but we, in yeah. Aladdin, but we don't know further. But you don't know his condition or, or, or what's happened to him since? No. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. Mm. We've been talking to so many Thank you. families. We just know he's. We just know in. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. I was just. I was just going to talk to you about what's been happening over the last ten days because I understand that many families are turning to social media. There have been billions of posts about what is going on uh, in Israel and uh, across in Gaza. Um, Hamas have been posting videos. They've been live streaming. Uh, since their initial attack, and I know that many families have been trawling through social media to try and find their loved ones, just to see them in Hamas videos. Your family have been doing the same. Yeah, uh, the, the Hamas would uh, originally have a, a 30, over 30 minutes live stream mm -hmm. uh, video when they kidnapped the whole five of them. Uh, it took, they took the class phone and uh, there is half an hour uh, live stream how they, they see the, the boy, the, the older boy, going through door to door and knock on... The, because Hamas, uh, they, they said to him, if you help us, we're not going to kill anyone, we just want to capture them. Yeah. Uh, we, we're not going to hurt anyone, so come and help us get the neighbours out. So you can see that... Uh, you can't see them in this video, but you can see in the different videos, that he's going to knock on the neighbor's door, trying to get them out, uh, what he think for safety. Uh, and in other, the, the, it's, again, it's in a half an hour uh, live stream that Hamas did on one of the kidnapper um, phone. So in one of the video, you can see how he knock on the door, they, the neighbor come out and they shoot them outside. So it, it, it's not an easy videos and uh, we're just trying to get the girls, not just the girls, but the girls and the people we know that are still alive, or at least the kids. At least the kids. I don't know how a human being, which Hamas is not a human being, uh, or anyone in Gaza. I'm sorry. Uh, we just need to get them we home just safely. Need, the kids need to come out. Um, and it's not political. It's no. reality. I know. Sorry. I, I know. Poli no, I, I totally understand. Putting the politics of this to one side, this is about people, and people on both sides are suffering. Correct. You're, you're in a position where you have two young girls. That I don't you know want if the people from the other home. side are suffering. I'm sorry. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry. They're not suffering, because if I, if I, if somebody hit me, I will hit him back. So I, you can't tell me uh, if I'm stronger than you and I hit you, you can't tell me I'm suffer. So don't don't start. Don't start. No. You can't tell I me they suffer. I'm sorry, they're not I suffering. No, I completely understand because, your point of view, but many people because, will be watching yeah, and, and what's going on in Gaza. In 2012, to I understand the emotion behind this, please. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, when, I'm not when, against when, you. We're not yeah. against anyone uh, on this programme. We're just no, no, trying no, to tell the stories. About against. It's about, it's about, I, I, I want to, I want to yeah. come back to the girls and I want to come back to the situation where yes. you can get them home because you're waiting for news. You're you're looking for videos of them, any word. What do you want to happen next? Because, yes. of course, what we are hearing here in the UK is that Israel is getting ready to mount a ground incursion. Um, they are attacking yes. Gaza. And the understanding is that the hostages are in Gaza. They're not attacking Gaza. How would Sorry, you... they're not attacking Gaza. OK, hitting uh, back. Say, I, I understand Gaza. that... I understand. Exactly. You have to be very careful about language because emotions are running high, and I totally understand I, that. I am very but careful, I'm trying but they're to not ask you... attacking Gaza. 
OK. They're what protecting I'm... our country. Retaliating. They're retaliating. I beg your pardon. What I want to understand is what you want to happen to bring the girls, as they're understood to be in Gaza, out safely. Yes. That's, that's, that's all we want. Not just the girls, because there is many other hostages alive. There is, as you know, there is the elderly, at least two old women there that uh, they capture. they there. I don't know what their uh, fate, but you can see them on the video. You can see the babies there, six months old baby. Uh, you can see the mother with the two kids uh, that have been captured. Uh, so not just the girls, we want everyone out. We want at least the mothers, the, the, uh, the babies, the kids. Mm. They need to come out. Um, that's what we want. I totally understand. And uh, the two girls are together, and I hope that brings you some comfort. And I, I really hope that they get back to your family well, safely. Well, I hope I hope they together. Hope they I, yeah. I hope they together. I hope they didn't separate between them, and yeah. and I hope they still together and not been yeah. separated. That's what we hope. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's the best you can hope for in such an awful situation. Our thoughts very much with you and, and your family and the, the families of all hostages taken. As you said, the, the hope is that, you know, they can be found and there can be some form of negotiations to get them back to you. As you said, it's, it's young people and it's the elderly that have mostly been targeted and um, the most vulnerable. Uh, Neil yeah. Darwish yeah. and Olivia oh, Saunders, thank you so much for coming on to highlight uh, what your thank family you. are going thank through. You. We really appreciate you your time. Thank you. Well, MPs uh, paid tribute to the victims of this Israel-Hamas war today in the Commons, holding a minute's silence before the Prime Minister addressed MPs. Rishi Sunak telling the House that the UK must support absolutely Israel's right to defend itself, as he called for the immediate release of the hostages taken by Hamas. Our deputy political editor Sam Coates reports now from Westminster. A Prime Minister showing the Jewish community and the country who he's standing with. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome the Prime Minister. Visiting a Jewish school in North London, a show of solidarity to a group who feel under siege. I want you to know, and that's why I'm here, that we will do everything we can to keep you safe and stand with Israel. Are you worried this conflict is driving division here in the UK? What can you do about it? Well, I've come to this Jewish school this morning specifically to demonstrate my solidarity with the Jewish community here in the UK. I'm determined to ensure that our Jewish community is able to feel safe on our streets. The scale of this massacre has shocked the world and united Westminster. A minute of silence in the Commons chamber to honour the dead on both sides. Six Britons have been killed in this war, ten still missing. The elderly, men, women, children, Babes in arms, murdered, mutilated, burned alive. We should call it by its name. It was a pogrom. The Labour leadership in lockstep with the government. Westminster is united. Britain is united. <coughs> with Israel, against terror, for international law and the protection of innocent lives. There are difficult days ahead. But our values cannot be compromised. Terror cannot win. There are senior figures concerned at the retaliation to come. We can support Israel and grieve with their people whilst recognising that how a counter-terrorism operation is conducted matters. And it matters because whilst there is an imperative to defeat Hamas in the immediate to secure Israel's future, how they are defeated will shape the region's future. The fiercest criticism of Israel coming from the left of the Labour Party. Will the Prime Minister make it clear to the Israeli government that indiscriminate airstrikes killing civilians is in clear violation of international law? Language like that has been rare in Westminster in recent days, a relative unity across the benches. Can it hold as this war moves into its next phase? Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, the Prime Minister confirmed that at least six British citizens were killed in the attack by Hamas on Israel. A further ten are still missing. The identities of five of the victims have been confirmed so far. Uh, they are Nathaniel Young, who had been serving with the IDF, the Israel Defence Forces, when he was killed on the Gaza border last Saturday. His family shared a post on Facebook saying they are heartbroken describing him as full of life and the life of the party. 
Bernard Cowan was also a victim of the Hamas attack. Cowan grew up around Glasgow but settled in Israel, where he lived with his wife and three tri children. 26-year-old Jake Marlowe, he was among more than 260 people who died when Hamas gunmen opened fire on crowds at a music festival at the start of the assault. He'd been working as a security guard at the event. Dor Shafir was also attending that festival with his fiancée when militants stormed the site, killing both of them. The couple were planning to get married next year. Photographer Dan Darlington, he has also been confirmed dead, originally from Manchester. Darlington was living in Germany and had been visiting Israel at the time. Tonight, a protest is taking place outside the BBC's London headquarters. This is over the corporation's reluctance to label Hamas as terrorists in their coverage. Ivor Bennett is outside the building in central London for us tonight. Uh, Ivor, tell us what's happening there behind you. Well, it's just starting to wind up, actually. Um, but for the last hour and a half or so, there has been a few hundred people out here waving Israeli flags and making themselves heard. They have been very loud indeed, chanting things like, shame on you at the BBC headquarters um, behind me. They gathered here to protest against the BBC's language in its coverage of the conflict, specifically its reluctance to use that word terrorist to describe Hamas. Instead, the broadcaster describes Hamas as militants or a militant group in line, they say, with their impartiality rules. People here, though, um, say that that is bias. They say it diminishes the actions of Hamas and they say it's designed to make the group more palatable uh, to viewers. And for the last 10 days or so, the BBC has come in for quite a lot of criticism for this policy that they've stuck to, not just from Jewish groups, but also from politicians. The Prime Minister even has weighed in saying that now is not a time for equivocation in the coverage of this conflict. Um, Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, also said that um, uh, the BBC has lost its moral compass. But the BBC has stuck to its guns and said um, that actually using that word will be taking sides and therefore um, we instead will just report precisely what's happening on the ground. It's up to, to viewers uh, to, to make up their own judgment. Instead, we'll stick to our impartiality rules. Um, so for now, uh, this protest will be dissipating and that's what the BBC will be sticking to. Ivor, thank you. And just to remind you that following the UK tonight, Anna Botting will be live in Tel Aviv for a special programme here on Sky News following the latest developments on this war between Israel and Hamas. That is coming up at nine o'clock. Still to come on the UK tonight, the government says minor offenders will do community service instead of prison time. This is in plans to help a prison system that's bursting at the seams. We'll have more details with our home editor next at find out how these spaniels are helping to tackle a possible bed bug infestation and why a village in Lincolnshire has a special connection to Walt Disney. I'm Inzamam Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. If the Taliban found your family, what would happen? I think they're just going to straight away execute them. There are issues of racism in all levels of cricket. I was on the balcony a couple of times. I was nearly gone. Football is a joy to watch. When people are disappointed, you can feel the hate. I've always tried to put people at the heart of the story. 
like hearing from young women who've been spiked via injections. I just felt physically sick. That's really in my system. Men, they want to force you doing something which you don't want to do just because you're homeless. We give a voice to communities often unheard and unserved from a region with a distinct history and global impact. Hello, welcome back. You're watching the UK tonight. Here's what's coming up. A transgender healthcare system not fit for purpose. That's according to Peter Lippmann, whose daughter Alice took her own life after waiting years for gender affirming treatment. We'll bring you their family story. And as the war between Israel and Hamas rages on, many parents find themselves navigating difficult discussions with their children. So, what is the best way to talk about it all? We'll discuss that a little later in the programme. Now, over the last couple of weeks here on the UK Tonight, we have told you about a prison system in England and Wales that is literally bursting at the seams. Jails overcrowded and seemingly unsafe. Well, today, the Justice Secretary announced government plans to try and tackle this issue, with minor offenders set to be spared jail time and instead sentenced to community service. Our home editor, Jason Farrell, has been following this story. Um, Jason, how do we get to this point? What did the Justice Secretary outline today? Well, the Justice Secretary is really trying to achieve three things today. First of all, he's got a, a prison population that is bursting at the seams, as you say. 7,000 additional prisoners this year is up 8%. And there's only 500 spare places left in, mm. the, in the prison service. So he knows that that's going to overflow. So he needs to introduce something that's going to reduce that. The second goal is to make people think, or perhaps he does believe, that all of the things that he's introducing are things that he wanted to do anyway. Mm. In other words, it's going to make things better for people. And then the third thing was that there was an article in the Sunday Times suggesting that one of the things that was going to happen is that judges were told to wait until they sentenced people, even people convicted of rape, keep them out on bail a bit longer so that they didn't go into the, into the prison system too early. So he was quite keen to put across that that wasn't going to happen. Mm. So we start our report with someone who was the victim of rape, who has very courageously waived their anonymity. Juliana lived in fear for months. The man who raped her had drugged her and videoed it. In the video evidence, he says, I'm completely raping you while you're asleep and unconscious and making a video of it as well. Yeah. So there is no denial of what happened. So there's a video confession. Exactly. Yet still it took two years to prosecute him and in that time he was out on bail. Given how manipulative and dangerous he was, I, I was afraid that he would come after me for... At least eight months, I did not leave my apartment. I didn't have a life. I had to quit my job. I was the one that was in house arrest. Last week, it was suggested judges would have to delay sentencing of convicted rapists because of the lack of prison spaces. How bad is it going to be for victims if even after trial, even after a conviction, they're still out? But in the Commons, the Justice Secretary looked to reassure the public. We will legislate so that rapists, as well as those convicted of equivalent sexual offences, will serve the entirety of the custodial term handed down to them by the courts. A 15-year custodial term will mean 15 years behind bars. Now, there have been inaccurate reports in the media claiming that judges are being told not to send rapists to prison. Let me be categorical. This is untrue. But the opposition wasn't convinced that some sex offenders won't remain on bail awaiting sentence. What is the plan to reach out to victims and assure them that the convicted offender in their case will be taken off the streets as quickly as possible? The reason we are in this position, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the government has consistently broken its promises to deal with the rising prison population. 
The government reforms to tackle this include turning many 12-month or less custodial sentences into community sentences, some lesser offenders released up to 18 days early and deporting foreign prisoners sooner. Currently, foreign nationals can be removed up to a year before the end of their sentence. The reform brings that forward to 18 months, which is hoped will save £70,000 per prisoner. But one former judge says that means they get out early and the cost efficiency may come with a moral price. Saves the country a bit of money and you may never know that they've then attacked and killed or raped or whatever someone in their home country, um, having been released early. The government says the reforms will reduce crime. The opposition says they should apologise for failing to keep the public safe. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Jason, let's talk a little bit about these reforms and um, what more could happen, because obviously the overcrowded prison system, that's not going to go away anytime soon. You know, it is what it is. The government are finding other way around, ways around it. But have these ways been received well? How's that gone down with those who want to reform the prison system? Well, I think what's interesting is some of them will actually be popular with the public. So, mm. for example, deporting... Uh, foreign prisoners sooner mm -hmm. will be popular. It's saving money, it's saving the government purse. And one of the big aspects of what he was talking about was saving money on, yeah. um, on prisoners. I think actually also what's interesting is by, keep, by not putting people to prison for, uh, for shorter sentences, mm -hmm. that quite a lot of people in the f who want to reform prisons would agree with that. And whether they've come across that policy by default because the prisons are so mm -hmm. full, Actually, many people say it's right that you, your rehabilitation is better if you don't go into mm. prisons, partly because the prisons are so awful. Mm. Um, and I think, thirdly, a lot of the public will be very happy that full term for sex offences, for example, means full term. Certainly Juliana, who you heard from mm -hmm. in that report, she's well up for that. And I think anyone who is a victim of rape will say, yeah, I want, to, I want my rapist to stay in prison for as long as possible. Yeah. Jason, thank you so much, Jason Farrell there, our home editor. Uh, right, let's take a look at some of the other stories making news in the UK tonight. Uh, one woman in a critical condition following a bus crash, uh, the bus crashing into a shop in Manchester city centre. Eleven others were injured in the collision and the 64-year-old driver was arrested on suspicion of causing serious injury by dangerous driving. The first new HIV awareness advert in 40 years has aired on TV in Scotland tonight. One pill a day means that it cannot be passed on and you can live a healthy, happy life. The advert, which will be accompanied by a wider campaign on billboards, newspapers and online, aims to send the message that stigma is more harmful than the virus itself. And sniffer dogs are being used in hotels and homes to detect bed bugs and tackle a wave of infestations. Among them, uh, these spaniels called Daisy and Holgar. Bed bug detection dogs go through similar training to those used by airport security and police to sniff out drugs, money and explosives. But the difference is uh, these spaniels are trained to smell the pheromones released by pets. Uh, still to come on the UK tonight. As the war between Israel and Hamas rages on, many parents find themselves navigating rather difficult discussions with children at home when they see uh, and hear some of the news. So what is the best way to talk to children about what's happening? We'll discuss that with the editor of First News, the international newspaper for young people. A transgender healthcare system that's not fit for purpose. That's according to Peter Lippmann, whose daughter Alice took her own life after waiting years for gender-affirming surgery. We'll bring you their story.
Hello, welcome back to the UK Tonight. I want you to listen now to the story of Alice Lippmann, a young transgender woman as told by her dad, Peter. The Lippmann family feel that transgender healthcare in the UK is not fit for purpose. A young person referred today for gender-affirming care, for example, would not have their first appointment for 20 years if the waiting lists stay as they are. Faced with that, Alice took her own life. A coroner has ruled that significant barriers which prevent transgender people accessing care contributed to the decline in Alice's mental health. Her family say that whilst they can't bring Alice back, they can keep campaigning to ensure transgender people get the care they need. They want to give the real story of the young people suffering behind the controversial headlines. Um, Peter, let's start by talking about Alice. Tell me about her. Yeah, it's really hard to, to summarise her. Um, obviously, I'm her dad. She was lovely. Um, she was always a, a kind of a gentle and quiet child, mm -hmm. um, a bit of a fish out of water in our family, but a quite a noisy bunch. So she was always the quietest. Yeah, she was lovely. Um, and then as she got older, she just got a little... And she hit her teenage years, was when we noticed that she was changing and just becoming a little bit more withdrawn and more difficult to talk to. When you talk about the change in Alice and when she finally felt ready to tell her parents that, that she was transgender, what was that conversation like? To be honest, it wasn't a very straightforward conversation. Um, Alice first came out to her sister um, when she was um, 15 or 16. Um, and her sister was very supportive and told her to go and see a GP, um, to get herself on the waiting list because she was going to be on it a long time. Um, but Alice didn't feel ready to talk to myself and my wife at that time. But she did go and see her GP. She knew what she wanted, she knew she was transgender and just didn't feel at the point of discussing it with her parents, but she did want to talk to medical professionals, those who would support her at the start of this journey. And what she was finding, that yes, there was love and support for her at home, but the support wasn't there elsewhere. And I'm talking about, you know, the NHS and, and gender affirming care. What was she struggling with there? What was that like for her? What was she not getting? I mean, it's a whole uh, range of things you're not getting. It's, it's actually just recognition mm -hmm. in the first instance, to be recognised and accepted for, for who you are. Um, so I think, I mean, one of the things that's come out in, in the inquest, or we've, we hope is coming out in the inquest, is firstly the recognition of the, the, the length of wait there is in this country before you get seen for gender-affirming care. Um, because when you think of NHS waiting lists, you think of two or three years, but in this case, it's something like... Well, the, the, the GIC um, accepted that with the, with the current wait list and the number of new patients they're seeing a month, that if you were referred tomorrow, you would be on the waiting list for over 20 years before your first appointment. The trans healthcare system, you believe, isn't fit for purpose and given the number of young adults going through this in the UK, that is a massive problem. It is. It's a huge problem. Um, I feel so sorry for anyone in Alice's position where you're really just being, you're almost, you're being told you don't matter, that we don't care. There's no service provision. Um, one of the things that the coroner uh, brought out was, you know, if that every, every turn, wherever we turned, it was always, we can't help you. Mm. And it was like, well, if you can't help us, who can? And there was never an answer mm. to, to that question. The coroner said at the time of her death, Alice had been on the waiting list for gender identity services for 1,023 days, which 
contributed to a decline in her mental health. Um, your wife Caroline uh, said as part of the inquest, we believe that if Alice was able to access gender affirming care when she first went to her GP back in 2018, she could still be with us today. Alice had a number of suicide attempts, but took her life last year. When you heard all of that at the inquest, how did you feel? Well, we felt validated because that's what we'd always believed. Um, and to be honest, we felt like Alice's story had been listened to by someone in authority for the first time. Um, I don't think that Alice had ever really been listened to by any, anyone she'd seen in an official capacity. Um, and I think that that wears you down. I mean, it wore us down as, as her parents, the constant fighting and battling and being turned down and rejected. But how that must feel for a young person who has this, this huge journey on their shoulders mm. to be constantly, effectively told, you don't matter. And eventually, sadly, Alice believed that. You want to share Alice's story to humanise those headlines, because while you know the trans population might be less than 1%, which is a figure people keep coming back on when they say, why are you talking about this so much? This is why. It doesn't matter if it's less than 1% of the population. These are, these are real, you know, real people. And actually, less than 1% of the population is quite a lot. The, um, the head of the GIC would, um, likened it to uh, the percentage of the population that have red hair. We all know someone who's got red hair. Yeah, someone sitting not too far away from you. Yeah. What would you say to parents starting this conversation with their child or navigating the journey? I know that's a difficult one because you probably don't want to offer advice, but they may find some comfort in hearing from you in terms of what you would say about the support that they can give because your family sounded like you did everything right by Alice. I mean, I think the main thing you can do, which is pretty universal for parenting, is, is listen. Mm. Is listen and love. That's all you can do, really. Um, and you're not alone, and your child's not alone. Encourage them to to seek support from the trans community. Educate and seek support yourself. Uh, well, thank you to Peter and the Littman family for uh, sharing Alice's story with us. Now, as this war between Israel and Hamas rages on, many parents are finding themselves in some difficult discussions with their children about what's going on, the conflict continuing to dominate news cycles and social media, which leaves many teenagers exposed to distressing stories and images of violence. So what's the best way for parents to approach this topic? I'm joined by Nikki Cox now, uh, editor of First News, Nikki Cox, MBE, uh, First News, of course, the international newspaper for young people. Um, Nikki, it's everywhere at the moment, even if you think your children aren't interested in what's going on in the Middle East, they will be exposed to it if they are on social media or on any of the platforms. So what's best for parents to do? Wait until the children come to you, or should you be on the front foot and go to your children? Yeah, I mean, the most important thing is that you do talk to them, because if you leave it up to what they're seeing on social media, they're being exposed to misinformation and disinformation, and we know that there's a lot of new accounts being set up which are designed to kind of spread the misinformation, mm -hmm. to confuse people, whether you're a government or an aid, aid, aid agency or a news organisation, mm -hmm. to try and understand what's going on is difficult, let alone a child. So it's really important that even if your child hasn't mentioned it to you, you don't know what they've seen or what they've heard or what they're making of it. Mm. So it's really important that you actually just check in with them and say, you know, have you heard about this? What are you thinking? Yeah, it's not just the distressing images. As you said, it's the misinformation. And also in terms of that misinformation, it's a complicated topic for adults to get their head around the situation in the Middle East, which is why many people don't discuss it. Mm -hmm. What's your advice to parents on tackling something they perhaps themselves don't understand? I think to direct them to a trusted 
source of information. Mm. Now, of course, on Sky News, we have our very own FYI, mm. which goes out every weekend, um, and on, on Sky News and uh, on Sky Kids. Um, and at First News, we come out every Friday. You know, we curate the content, especially for children. Mm. We are avoiding too much distressing detail mm. or imagery. And we've got this week a, a big two-page feature explaining the background, which actually is a good thing for adults to read too, right. um, just to put it all into context and to make sure that they really do have an understanding of what's going on. Nikki Cox, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, right, stay with us here on The UK Tonight. We'll be back. We're going to take a short break. Um, Golda was the Prime Minister of Israel in 1973 when the country was surprised by an attack by Syria and Egypt. Um, like the current situation, um, uh, it, it was an absolute shock for the country. But um, she managed to pull her generals together and uh, led the country eventually to a victory and proved herself to be an absolute rock of uh, intelligence and uh, courage. She was born in what was Russia, now Ukraine. Kiev, actually, wasn't it? Kiev, exactly, uh, at the turn of the last century, and um, grew up um, w w with the shadow of the pogroms. Um, her family, her father, who's a very humble carpenter, decided to move the uh, family to the United States. And one by one, he saved up money each year to send each of the children, eventually followed himself. And they settled in Milwaukee, and Golda loved living in America. She loved the freedom. She proved a, 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 a sort of a natural leader. And um, by the time she was 22, she led a group of um, Jews back to what was Palestine in 1920 um, to um, set about building uh, the new Israel. I think she felt that um, that's what she needed to do. That was her calling. Uh, as I said, she was enormously um, uh, um, keen on America and knew the American people well, well and was enormously... Uh, when, in 1948, when, once again, the War of the Independence began, uh, Israel was a, a, an impoverished country and she um, went to the United States and in six weeks raised $50 million. Wow. Um, by just doing rubber chicken dinners. Uh, I have a friend who lives in Los Angeles whose grandfather attended one of these uh, dinners and Golda persuaded him to remortgage his house. Um, and this was a phenomenal sum of money and it was enough to equip the army, uh, which eventually managed to see off attacks from every single neighbour. We're back with the UK tonight. Some breaking business news to bring you now about one of the UK's biggest manufacturing companies. It's coming from our city editor, Mark Kleiman, who joins me on the phone now. Mark, what have you got for us? Yeah, that's right, Sarah Jane. Some uh, news about Rolls Royce Holdings, the FTSE 100 aircraft engine manufacturer. I understand that Rolls Royce will announce tomorrow, Sarah Jane, that it's cutting around two and a half thousand jobs from its global workforce. Now, to be clear, not all of these redundancies will fall in the UK, but I do understand that hundreds of British-based jobs will be affected by this move. And this is one of the most significant restructuring moves made so far by Tufan Ergen Bilgic, uh, Rolls' new chief executive. We should get more detail on this uh, to the London Stock Exchange uh, tomorrow morning, Sarah Jane. Mark, thank you so much. Mike Kleiman across the details there. Uh, more to come throughout the course of the evening. And, of course, head to our website, skynews.com. We're going to take a look at the sports news now. Uh, Dave's here with that. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. This house behind us is going to be about eight weeks away from being done. But we're going to be showing you this one today. This yeah. one's all done, ready to go, uh, just needs furnishing. Perfect. Take yeah. a look. Yeah. That's good. Leave on a dirty the floor. Let me take my shoes off. In the last 12 months, he's been at three different clubs in two different countries. Callum hudson Adoy is still only 22. Now he's desperate for Nottingham to be his new substantive home. This is the master, he said, the master bedroom. 
Yeah. You've got a couple of options. Upstairs has got some good rooms as well. So. Yeah. Plenty of rooms. It's for needed I'm for trainers. How many, how many trainers have you got? How many have you got? I think I've got... Oh, I don't even know. Are we talking hundreds? Are we, are we, I are think we... hundreds. Am I in the hundreds? Can, can, you, can, you, can, you, yeah. can you extend the... Uh, the, the I might need more. Before it. We'll knock through to another room. I think there's another bit here. There's another bit you can actually survive. Yeah. So just no. shoes in here, Just shoes. I just need shoes in here. <laughs> Nottingham Forest made a record six signings on transfer deadline day. Snapping up hudson Adoy for just £5 million was a standout deal. Especially when you consider that Bayern Munich offered in excess of £40 million for him just three years ago. What was that day like? It was pretty surreal, wasn't it? I've never been in a situation where it's just transfer deadline day. Like you're thinking to yourself, is it going to happen? Is it not? We're at the forest ground. Like I'm seeing all the fans here expecting me fully to be done and everything. And I was just so buzzing to when they got over the line. I was just like, yeah, I'm here now. Delighted to be here. Everybody's around and I see you guys. And I was like, all right, this is perfect. Steve Cooper, how important was he in the decision? Major. He rang you up, didn't he? Yeah, yeah he rang me. He rang me a couple of times, to be fair. He's a very, very good guy, very good manager. And I said, hopefully he gets the fully best out of me. Cooper was England under-17's manager in 2019, when hudson Adoy played in every game to help the Young Lions lift the World Cup. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Let's have a look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. The UK is fine but cold tomorrow. Storm Babette bringing rain and strong winds to Ireland and then to much of Britain from Wednesday onwards. Before then, fine this evening, bar a few light showers in the far north and near southeastern coasts. Temperatures dropping sharply tonight and extensive frost or ground frost developing in the north and the east. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, it's been exactly 100 years since Walt Disney founded his famous film studio. But why has a village in Lincolnshire been honoured at the start of all its movies since 2006? Well, Norton Disney, which is around 15 miles outside of Lincoln, was visited by the legendary filmmaker back in 1949 after he heard of his family's centuries-old connection to it. And now, every film features his family coat of arms flying on the Disney castle. Well, joining me now is the chair of Norton Disney Parish Council, Vanessa Hall. Vanessa, good evening to you. So take us back to the beginning and Disney's association uh, with your village. Well, it goes back a long way, a lot before 1949. Um, the Disneys actually came over um, in the Norman Conquest from France with William the Conqueror. And they were from the town of Isney and they eventually settled in a place called Norton, and it was called Norton to Isney, um, because it was um, they was where they're from of Isney. Eventually, the apostrophe got lost, and it was just called Disney. So it's Norton Disney, and um, there is a charter actually in the Lincolnshire archives. Um, going back several hundred years, actually states that this area was actually called Disneyland. Um, <laughs> so the Disney first Disneyland was actually yeah. in Lincolnshire. I love that. And Walt Disney came to came to the village to trace his ancestry, and, it, 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 he's, and that's where yes, the coat of arms came from. That's where he discovered that. That's on the Disney flag above the famous Disney castle at the front of all the movies, and of course in Disneyland and Disney World themselves. That's right. He saw. Um, he went in the church, our local church, and he saw the Disney crypts, which are still there now for anyone to go and have a look at. And they, uh, he noticed the coat of arms on one of the, the, the crypts and he took a photograph of it. And he, since then, it has featured on, in every single film that Disney have made. And it's on the beginning, um, it flies over the... If you you know the, the Disney logo has got the Cinderella castle. Yeah, I know it well. On the beginning of every film, yes. Well, flying above that is the flag, and that flag has got the Disney coat of arms, which actually came from Norton Disney in Lincolnshire. It's amazing, so, isn't it? 
It's just such a fantastic link, uh, Vanessa. Thank you for talking to us. Vanessa Hall, uh, Chair of Norton Disney Parish Council, uh, celebrating 100 years of Disney. Of course, Norton Disney been around a lot longer than that. Thank you so much for talking to us on this 100th anniversary of Disney. Really appreciate your time. And uh, that's yep. it for the UK tonight. We'll see you tomorrow.